Without further ado, let me introduce to you our speaker for today. Today, we are privileged to have Andrew Katai preach to us. Now, who is Andrew Katai? Andrew Katai is the CEO of City to City Australia. Okay, and City to City is a church planting network under the leadership of Timothy Keller. And Andrew is not only CEO of City to City Australia, but he's also senior ministers at Christ Church Inner West in Asheville. Okay, so he's actually <laughs> located in Sydney. And Andrew is such a brilliant man. I have the privilege of listening to him and being taught by him in a couple of, of my sessions in under City to City. And I, me and my dad, we just absolutely love him. And today we have the privilege and honor to listen to him bringing the word to us, okay? But before we get into the word, let's read the scripture together. Hello and welcome all. Today we're going to be reading from Hebrews 4.14 until 5-10. to So why don't we all stand up on our feet and honor the word of the Lord together. Let us begin reading in the count of three. One, two, three. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with the confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. For every high priest chosen from among men is appointed to act on behalf of men in relation to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He can deal gently with the ignorant and wayward, since he himself is beset with weakness. Because of this, he is obligated to offer sacrifice for his own sins, just as he does for those of the people. And no one takes this honor for himself, but only when called by God, just as Aaron was. So also Christ did not exalt himself to be made a high priest, but was also appointed by him who said to him, You are my son, today I have begotten you. As he says also in another place, You are a priest forever, after the order of Melchizedek. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverence. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him, being designated by God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Church, this is the word of the Lord. Amen. Hi, Rock Church. It's uh, Andrew Caddo here. Um, uh, it's uh, great to be with you today, although not as good as it would be if... I was in person, and it's just yet another event uh, that has been coveted. Um, I have the privilege of uh, leading a church planting agency called City to City Australia, and it's through City to City that I've met Pastor Josiah and Pastor Sem uh, a little bit over the last 18 months, uh, which has been a, a real uh, joy to me, and hence uh, their invitation to come and uh, be with you uh, this Sunday, which was a great plan when we set it up earlier in the year. Uh, and now all it is is digitally in this strange COVID world uh, that we inhabit. Um, let's pray now that even though we haven't met each other, I don't know you, you don't know me, um, nonetheless, by the power of his spirit, by whom God breathed out his word, uh, that the living Lord would speak to each of our hearts today. Let's pray. Our gracious God and loving Heavenly Father, you know us, you know our situation, you know our needs, you know our fears and our hopes you know, our dreams and our gifts. We pray that you would minister to us now, that you'd write your word on our hearts, that we would know the comfort and consolation of your grace and that you would lift us up and fill us with your spirit and send us out into your world as agents, heralds, ambassadors of your grace. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, no doubt you are struggling under lockdown in all sorts of different ways, frustration, uh, sameness, day after day, plans crushed, perhaps real financial hardship. And I know that uh, you will love people who are facing even greater challenges uh, in Indonesia. Uh, we regularly pray for Indonesia in our staff team since uh, one of our team members has family there. Her, her father actually uh, died there from COVID last year. And so it's, it's a very, very difficult situation. Right now, as a society, uh, we are learning more about trials 
and the temptations that trials bring than perhaps at any other time in recent memory. Though, of course, for many people, trials are not new at all. A friend of mine, in fact, the person who was uh, the most humanly influential in leading me to Christ uh, many years ago, uh, was one of the most energetic, vibrant, committed, focused Christian young men that I knew. Uh, Ben's love for God, his contribution to church, his care for people were evident in his life and were known by many. And then he was struck down by that terrible affliction, chronic fatigue syndrome. It robbed him of 10 years of his life. For the whole of his 20s, he was basically incapable of relating to other people. He simply had no energy for anything or anyone. He would try to enter conversations and it would end up with him being like a black hole. He would just suck all the life out of a situation. Others knew it. He knew it. He slept more hours than he was awake. He moved from job to job and then to no job. And the light burned very dimly in his life. And he hated God for it. He came to deeply resent the fact that he'd suffered like this. While so many of his friends enjoyed their 20s to the hilt. He was confined to a couch in front of a TV at best. And in his bed more often. And now, in his 50s, he gives no thought to Jesus Christ at all. Uh, Jesus, followed by the writers of the New Testament, has a word for that kind of experience. It's the Greek word pyrasmos. It's a word with a bit of room in it. Uh, Jesus uses it in the prayer that he taught us, which uh, we now call the Lord's Prayer. Lead us not into temptation. You remember that? Lead us not into temptation. Lead us not into pyrasmos. Sometimes the word means temptation to sin. That tug on our souls to do that which is wrong by God and wrong by others. But on the other hand, sometimes the word means something one step back of that. What we would call a trial, a testing, a a situation of difficulty or suffering, darkness or dreariness. And the fact that this Greek word pyrasmos has both of these senses about it is not accidental because it's often the case that trials are the occasions of temptations. And it's the spiritual realities that Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 to chapter 5, verse 10, which we're going to look at today, it's the spiritual realities that we see there that bring us the strength in times such as these times of trial. We're going to look at it under three headings. Uh, The first one, what do we often learn from our trials? And then uh, secondly, what did Jesus learn from his trials? And then finally, the astonishing reality that the throne of the living and true God is a throne of grace. So first then, what, what do we often learn from our trials? The fact is, of course, trials come in all sorts of ugly and deadening shapes and sizes. A relationship breaks down and you wonder whether you'll ever find anyone right for you. And so you're tested, you see. You endure a financial disaster and what once seemed secure and locked down is now dreadfully shaky and uncertain and you're tested. You cherish a dream for years, looking forward to the day when it's going to come true. And then one day you realise not only that it hasn't become true so far, But it's never going to happen. Not this year, not next year, not the year after. The dream dies and so does a part of you and you're tested. You're tested. And when your heart aches with hurt or loss, when you're tired with a weariness that sleep does not refresh, when all you can see is the mountain ahead of you and no capacity to climb it, The option first to question God and then to demand of God and finally to hate God is very powerfully present. It's one of the favourite strategies of the evil one. There is a profound spiritual dynamic that goes on in times of trial and testing. It's what the author of the letter to the Hebrews calls our weakness, 
the human condition of sinfulness, that, that we experience the valleys of life, the, the trials of bad and sometimes terrible circumstances, and as a result, we experience the temptation to sin, to turn our backs on the God who made us and sustains us and calls us, and then to give into them t- that temptation. Pyrasmos, trial leading to temptation, leading to sin. Now, the trials that the first readers of the letter to the Hebrews were facing were severe, they were brutal, and they were immediate. Uh, They've been robbed of their goods in the past, and now they face the prospect of losing not just their possessions, but their lives as well. In chapter 12, verse 4, the writer says that they have not yet resisted to the point of shedding their blood. They haven't yet resisted sin to the point of actually shedding their blood, but boy, it sounds like it might not be long. They're right on the edge. They're fiercely pressed. They're being tested. And as is always the case, the trial is proving to be a moment of temptation. And some are teetering on the brink of caving in, of giving up, of letting go of the confession of their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And you know the reasoning that goes on, don't you? You know the things that you say to yourself. Surely if Jesus understood, surely if he knew what I was going through, surely if he had the slightest sense of my pain, he would do something, wouldn't he? So often, that's what we learn from our trials. It's what we wrongly learn from our trials. Our trials teach us to doubt the goodness and grace of God. And so the magnificent, gospel-centred, grace-drenched pastor who writes this pastoral letter to the Hebrew Christians, um, tempted to go the easy, politically approved route of returning to the religion of their forebears, Judaism, well, this pastor does what, if you've read the letter to the Hebrews, will be no surprise to you. He shows us Jesus. We're going to pick it up in chapter 5, verse 7. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death. He was heard because of his reverent submission. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And having been made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation For all who obey him, having been designated by God a high priest, according to the order of Melchizedek. The point of reference from which we take our bearings in relation to Jesus is the days of his flesh. Uh, That time when Jesus was as vulnerable, as hurtable as we are. He suffered. We see this, of course, in the gospel accounts, the rejection by his own people even by his own family at one point, who regarded him as deranged, as mad. The constant threat to his life as his enemies manoeuvred to arrest and murder him, and ultimately, of course, the success of their plans, as Jesus gives himself over to them, is whipped and is beaten, is scourged and is crucified, degraded and humiliated as a detestable terrorist, this one who was the son of the living God. You see, of course, in this, Jesus is tested. Jesus is trialed. Jesus is pyrasmos in every way that we are. Physically, emotionally, relationally, spiritually, he felt the full weight of the testing. He understood the depths of his, in the depths of his soul, the tug of the temptation. There is no dimension of trial, there is no texture of temptation that we experience that he did not experience. He knows it all from the inside, except that he never gave in. He never did sin. Pyrasmos never got to take him there. That weakness is never ascribed to him. Instead... He did something else, you see. What he did was to offer up prayers and supplications, requests, desperate, urgent 
requests. Like you remember, let this cup pass from me. Don't make me have to go through this, Father. I don't know if I can bear this. With loud cries, with tears. And as the writer puts it, to the one who he knew was able to save him from death. Now notice uh, three things about this. Uh, Firstly, Somehow the spiritual dynamic that operates for Jesus is almost the exact reverse that so often operates for us. For for Jesus, the experience of even the most severe trial, which brought with it the most severe temptation to turn his back on the Father, rather than leading him into sin away from God, instead led him into spiritual intensity of connection with God. Do you see that? Jesus' relationship to the Father didn't somehow float six inches above the earth, untouched by the things that were going on around him and to him. No, no, what you see here is prayer, supplications, loud cries, tears. That is the texture of his relationship to the Father, precisely as the overflow of a soul being pyrasmosed, of being tested, of being tempted and pushed and examined in the fire. Our our pastor, the author of uh, the letter to the Hebrews, summarises it by saying that even though Jesus was the Son of God, the one through whom and for whom all things were created, the heir of all things, the reflection of God's glory, the exact imprint of God's very being, even then Jesus still had something to learn. It's it's an incredible thought, isn't it? That Jesus still had something to learn. He learned obedience through what he suffered. It was the one thing he'd never had from all eternity, suffering. And it brought with it its own form, its own pattern of obedience. Because obedience like this is the kind of thing that can never be learned in a classroom. It is always and only learned in the heat of the battle and in the midst of the trials. He learned obedience. And so he cried out to God through his tears, yet not my will, but yours be done. How did it work for him like that? Notice the second thing. Why was it that the trials which tempted him led him towards God rather than away from God. You you see what our pastor tells us? Because he offered those prayers and shed those tears before the one who was able to save him from death and who heard him because of his reverent submission. Jesus knew that what was happening to him right there and then didn't change who the father was. He was and is and always will be the one who is able to save us from death. The the double meaning here, I'm sure, is deliberate. Yes, God was the one who was able to save Jesus from death, and yes, Jesus was heard because of his reverent submission to the Father's will for his death. And so, of course, that included rather than avoided the cross. It was not from the cross that Jesus was saved. It was through the cross. He was saved from death, yes, but only after death. Which then leads to the third point. Because you see, this is designed precisely to comfort those original readers whose own possible martyrdom, the shedding of their blood, was on the horizon in an all-too-pressing way. That in the midst of their trials, trials which were tempting them to let go of their profession of faith and the confidence and pride that belong to hope, that they instead can walk in the footsteps of Jesus. That they too can offer up prayers and requests with loud cries and tears to the one who is able to save them from death knowing that they will be heard in their reverent submission, 
even if the way God saves them from death is like the way he saved Jesus from death by mighty resurrection after death. Now, it's very, very important to not go too far with this. This doesn't somehow make suffering good. This doesn't whitewash over the agony of the soul that suffering and trials and pain and death bring. That, that's a terrible thing to go take this thought and extend it all the way to say that actually suffering in the end is a good thing. No, God is not an evildoer. God is not an evildoer. Suffering and pain and death are always still alien intruders, hateful alien intruders into God's good world. Now, this doesn't justify suffering. It shows us that God is so powerful that he's able to wrench good out of suffering. And therefore, it shows us what we are to do in the midst of suffering. To see Jesus not turning away from the Father in the midst of pain, but precisely because of the pain, turning to the Father as the only one ultimately who can do anything about it at all. You see, the truth about trials is this. Trials will never leave you unchanged. Trials will always make their impact on your soul. They will either push you away from God if you let them into bitterness and numbness and anger or they will push you deeper into God with prayers and supplications and loud cries and tears, a depth of spiritual intimacy with that one place, that one person, that one source of hope that stands even bigger and stronger and more eternal than the trials that you're facing the one who is able to save you from death. Trials will never leave you unchanged. And the only question is then, which way is it going to work for each of us? Which way will the trials push us? But there's one more step in the argument that we need to get. See, it makes good sense that a son should cry out to his father, that's what fathers are for. But, but you might ask yourself, that, that's all right for Jesus, but, but, but who am I to come before God? What right do I have to come before God? And the answer is, you have every right in the world, not by nature, but by grace. Because Jesus is not just an example to us. No, he's even more than that. He is a source of eternal salvation for us. He's not just a son of God. He's also a high priest for us. Now, if you remember um, back to the start of the letter to the Hebrews, this is where it has been driving for all of the first three and four chapters. At the end of chapter two, we're told that Jesus is a faithful and merciful high priest in the service of God. Uh, Chapters three and four explore what it means that Jesus was faithful and how his faithfulness calls for our faithfulness. And now in chapter 5, the focus is on the mercy of our high priest and how it calls for us to lean on his mercy. The thing is, for us, often the word priest has almost no positive connotations at all. Uh, The thought that somehow at the core of your being, you are sufficiently morally and spiritually repulsive, that that you and I need someone acceptable to fill in for us and stand in our place and represent us, because that's what a high priest does. We find that thought almost unbearable. But that's exactly what's at stake in the idea of a priest. Now, it, it, it may be that the reason you find that an unbearable thought is because you've just really understood that Jesus is your only high priest, faithful and merciful, and therefore you don't need any other high priest, and you get a bit cranky when someone else seems to assume that they can function like a high priest for you. That, that might be the case. But I suspect that our allergy to the idea of priests is a little bit different. It might be that we have so slim a grasp on the holiness of God 
that we have so slim a grasp on the unholiness of our own souls that it would never occur to us that someone could possibly ever have a problem with me. And if they did, that would be their issue, not mine. We, we live in a world tragically incapable of calling a moral spade a shovel. We, we're utterly insistent on lowering the bar to give false comfort to our souls. That moral bar, just nice and low enough so I can step over it. People endlessly behave in selfish and greedy and immoral and loveless ways and that's just how they treat other human beings, let alone total spiritual disinterest in God. At a trivial but telling level, I was talking uh, to some neighbours a little while ago who have to share a driveway between the four of them. They're grown adults. They've got to share a driveway. It's not that complicated. Except they were behaving like spoiled bratty children who wouldn't share their toys, fighting and bickering. And yet at other times they've, they've always wanted to tell me, ministers often get this, oh, you know, I'm a good person. They're not good people. And neither are you and neither am I. We're unclean, we're unholy, we're spiritually desperately in need and the greatest need we have is for a priest, a great and merciful and faithful priest in the service of God on our behalf. And unless you really get that, you'll never understand Jesus. You'll never really see what it is that he's done for you you'll never really get the cross. For the, for the original hearers, that Jesus was a high priest uh, carried with it a kind of sting in the tail. It meant that if Jesus was their high priest, then they sure didn't need to go to Judaism to obtain a high priest. They already had a great high priest in Jesus. And it'd be nuts to go from him backwards like that. And Jesus' legitimacy is beyond doubt. See how our author is at pains to make that clear, chapter 5, verse 1, every high priest chosen from among mortals is put in charge of things pertaining to God on their behalf to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He's able to deal gently with the ignorant and wayward since he himself is subject to weakness. And because of this, he must offer sacrifice for his own sins as well as for those of the people. And he does not presume to take this honour, but takes it only when called by God, just as Aaron was. You see what the author's doing here? He says three things about the garden variety priest in Jewish religion. He's not self-appointed, but God-appointed. He's in charge of things pertaining to God, which means specifically to make sacrifices to God for sins. And he's sympathetic, able to deal gently with people and so to represent them to God with care. And what's so important about that is that our author is absolutely determined to make sure that we see that Jesus fulfills all three of those criteria. Verse 5, so also Christ did not glorify himself in becoming a high priest, but was appointed by the one who said to him, you are my son, today I have begotten you. And as he says also in another place, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And having been made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. Can you see, can you hear how Jesus fulfills the criteria? He's our high priest because he didn't glorify himself. He was glorified by God in being appointed. He offered up prayers and supplications and ultimately his own life for our sins. And his days were days of flesh. He suffered. He walked with us in the valley of the shadow of death. And having done the job to the very end, that's what it means to say being made perfect, being made complete. He did the job to the very end. He has therefore become the source of eternal salvation to all who submit to him, to all who obey him. Dear friends, right here is the secret of finding that our trials won't lead us away from God into sin, but instead the secret of learning obedience from our sufferings to draw near to God. On the one hand, we have the example of Jesus 
which shows us that we should pour our hearts out to God. But at the same time, and even more fundamental than that, we have the achievement of Jesus, which means that we can pour out our hearts to God, that we have a place of love before the throne of God, and that his throne is for us not a throne of judgment, not a throne of fear, but a throne of grace. Remember back in chapter 4, verse 14, since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathise with our weaknesses, but we have one who in every respect has been tested as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore approach, our author says, the throne of grace with boldness, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. It's so interesting. This is the only instruction in the whole section. It's the only thing we're told to do. In our time of need, when things are hard or even terrible, when trials press in upon us and tempt us to doubt God or even to rage against him, then let us do what Jesus did and let us do it because of what Jesus did. Let us approach the throne of grace with boldness so that we may receive mercy and find grace. Uh, I don't know about you, I have never been near any actual royal throne. Uh, I've been uh, in, uh, in London uh, to uh, various kind of royal uh, palaces, but never actually got close to the throne. You know, it would have been a great thing. But my guess is that your typical throne from your typical king is not characterised by grace. It's characterised by fear and bodyguards with guns and power and threat. That's how thrones work. Except for God's throne. Not God's throne. It is for us a throne of grace. Pure, beautiful, soul-nurturing, amazing grace. Grace enough to get us through even the most profound of trials and the hardest of tests and the deepest of sufferings. I, of course, I don't know what trials you're experiencing at the moment, uh, the particular shape and texture that that takes for you in this pandemic experience. I'm sure that for some in your church community and family and friends in Indonesia, they're extremely hard-pressed. Soul-numbing grief, desperate loneliness, decade-long disappointment, rank confusion that life could be turning out this way. These are all features of some people's lives. I don't, I don't know what the particulars are for you, but what I do know is this. Trials are the normal course of life for human beings this side of glory. It is in pain that we are born. It is by the sweat of our brow that we live and then we die. Of course, that's not the whole story. But nor is the story whole without recognising that there is just no such thing as a trial-free, test-free life. Trials are the normal course for human beings this side of glory. We should never be surprised. We ought to be the least surprised by suffering. And with those trials and with that suffering will come temptation. Temptation to turn your back on the one who knows you and the one who loves you, and the one who saves you and the one who has reserved a place for you in glory. There is a temptation to harden your heart and become bitter toward God and it comes in different ways. Sometimes it comes with a ferocious force that stands in front of you as clear as day. Sometimes it comes to you with desperate, deep subtlety so that you hardly even realise what's happening. 
it just gradually increases the temperature on you until you look back over the last weeks and months and find that you've barely prayed to God, you've barely given thanks to God, you've barely uh, joined with his people in worship at all. And the question that our pastor, the author of the letter to the Hebrews, puts to us today, each one of us, is this. What are you going to learn from trials as they come your way? Will you be like Jesus and ensure that the spiritual dynamic at work in your soul is such that you learn obedience through what you suffer? That you live all of life before God in reverent submission so that when it is your time of need, you approach the throne of God and find it to be a throne of grace, a source of mercy, of overflowing generosity because you have there sitting on that throne someone who has been there before you, who in every respect has been tested as you have been tested and who so walks with you in love. Let's pray. Come before that throne of grace right now and pray that the Lord would minister to us. Let's pray together. Our gracious God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we lift up our hearts to you in praise and worship, Lord Jesus Christ, that you walked in the days of flesh with us as one of us, that you know what it is to experience trials, desperate, deep, dark trials, temptations, but that you stood firm, you endured the cross, you despised its shame for the joy that was set before you, the joy of bringing many children to the Father. We pray that even now as we experience trials of different sorts and you know what they are, some of us only light, for others of us very deep and dark and heavy. We pray that you would minister to us, each one of us now, that you would give to us such a vision of your triumph in resurrection, such a knowledge of your grace and assurance of your love, that these trials would only deepen us in you. Make us encouragements to one another, we pray, and strengthen us by your Holy Spirit, and we ask it for your glory. Amen.